Well, good morning, everyone. And I trust that you were able to get some sleep last night and you're ready to take on a new week with the Lord. And uh, I am here, albeit a little weary, uh, but excited to begin a week of Vacation Bible School virtually. And uh, it seems like there's a little more to do in terms of uh, what has to take place on this side for a virtual VBS than sometimes uh, a night VBS on the week of. And, uh, but we are trusting the Lord for uh, great things. Uh, I want to just simply begin by saying that I received a phone call this morning, uh, Linda and I, at uh, 2.25 a.m., uh, indicating that Pat, had, uh, Pat Chapman had gone to be with the Lord. And uh, we need to really be in prayer for Brother Kurt uh, through these days. And uh, uh, we'll be spending much time with him and helping him to the fullest extent of our abilities over uh, the coming days. Uh, so pray for God's guidance, his wisdom, his strength, as today we'll be uh, dealing with the funeral home and, and all of the things that go along with uh, these final arrangements. And uh, we, we need God's grace. Uh, there hadn't been a whole lot of sleep over the last few days. And so we're, we're trusting the Lord that when we're weak, then he's strong. And uh, I, uh, I can say that... Uh, God answers prayer, and uh, I know that uh, Brother Kurt was uh, talking to me yesterday saying, I just, just don't know why God doesn't answer this prayer. And the fact is that uh, we prayed for God to do a work of healing, and at 2.22 this morning, he did. You see, he affected the perfect healing because when she opened her eyes in heaven, she was perfectly whole, not struggling for breath, but in a glorified body. And so the Lord does not always answer exactly as we would want for him to, but he does answer our prayer. And it is always for the best for that person prayed for. And sometimes while we don't think it is, it's always for our best as well. And it teaches us to simply trust that his way is perfect, even when we don't understand. And uh, I know that uh, that's a hard thing for many people to uh, wrap their minds around uh, when they have suffered a profound loss. And uh, I, I've learned through the years that when people have suffered a loss, sometimes it's better for us not to try to give them platitudes or tell them what we think or feel. Often it's just good to just be still and to be there to be a help and to listen. <clears throat> it rarely comforts anyone when we say things like, I know how you feel, because in that moment, they're not really sure that you do. And the fact is that many of you have been through the loss of a spouse and you can imagine how he feels, but no one knows exactly how he feels except the Lord. Um, the other day I was talking to Brother Monty who uh, laid three wives in his lifetime to rest and he's had more heartache in one life than most people will have in 10. And I just tell you, I, I can't look at the man and say, I know how you feel. In fact, I, I hope I don't know until I see Christ. And so I, I just want to be a comfort in prayer. I want to be a shoulder that someone can lean on and cry on. And I want to have my gaze fixed on heaven. And sometimes people, uh, they, uh, I think, super spiritualize everything and they say things like, well, don't be sad. Why are you so sad? They're in heaven. Um, we're so sad because we love them and because they meant so much to us and our tears are an expression of our love and of the depth uh, of the kind of relationship that we shared. And if someone can just pass from this life without the shedding of tears, uh, it would make me wonder what that person truly meant to a soul. And I, I just know that uh, there are many tears 
that have been shed because uh, Pat was <clears throat> many things. She was one of a kind. <clears throat> sometimes uh, uh, loud, sometimes funny, always sweet, and one of the most generous people that I have ever known. Uh, I have seen her go without and live simply and humbly so that others could be helped. And, uh, and that's a great testimony and a legacy to leave. And so we're thankful to the Lord for that. I wanna encourage you, if you have your Bible this morning, to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter five. And <clears throat> this week, we're going to be meeting uh, at 9.15 on Facebook Live for our morning devotions. And uh, we have Vacation Bible School virtually. It'll be starting at 10 o'clock this morning. And that's why we're adjusting the time just a little bit. And uh, that way we're not uh, stepping on top of one another. We'll allow a few minutes of breathing room there. And uh, I hope that when our study comes to an end this morning that <clears throat> many of you will circle up the kids or call kids that you know and encourage them to uh, go on our YouTube channel or uh, find us here on Facebook Live. <clears throat> I know that many of you are more technically savvy than I am and you can cast it to your television set and uh, that way the kids will uh, sit there and it'll be just like they're watching Saturday cartoons at home or something like that and I hope that they really enjoy it. Now it's going to be at 10 o'clock and uh, it's going to be a kickoff. It'll, it'll be about, oh, 25 or so minutes uh, to kick it off. It'll be okay because that's as long as a full-length cartoon would be uh, for them on Saturday minus the, the uh, commercials. And uh, then uh, we'll invite them to break out of the house and, and come down to the church during the course of the day and uh, drop off their offerings, pick up their crafts and get their t-shirts and all the things that we've prepared for them, their memory verses. And uh, then they'll have a chance to, uh, if they want to try to quick learn that verse and say it, they can say it. We want to videotape a lot of that. We're going to try to accumulate some uh, video footage so that we can show at the end of the week a little video of what VBS uh, was like in 2020 during COVID-19 uh, so that our church family could receive the blessing from that. And then every night at 7 o'clock, Monday to Friday, we're going to have a live broadcast. There'll be some taped portions of it, uh, but uh, it'll be about an hour from 7 to about 8 o'clock on Monday to Friday night. <clears throat> it'll include music. It'll include some skits and humor. Uh, it's going to include uh, the offering contest and, uh, and then a gospel presentation each night. And so be in prayer, if you would, for that as we <clears throat> are making plans and, uh, and really just pray that the Lord would use this in the hearts of every young person uh, that is a participant. If you haven't registered the kids, uh, you can go use the church app and, and register them. You could go online to our website at freewaybaptist.org and register them. And uh, we're, there's ways that we can communicate with you to try to get you the things that you need for the children uh, during this Vacation Bible School. I want us to just begin with the word of prayer and then we'll dig into the word of God. Father God, how we thank you for the hope that we have of heaven. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we sorrow, but not as those which have no hope. And God, I pray this morning you'd be with Brother Kurt, that you would encourage him in the inner man, strengthen him. And Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church family to continue to I lift him up and to uh, just be a help to him through these days. And Lord, I pray that um, in this time of a pandemic that uh, we would stay focused on the fact that uh, people need the Lord. And so Lord, help us to be steadfast in our witness. And Lord God, I pray that today you would use me to be a blessing to these your people. For this I pray in the lovely name of Jesus. Amen. I want us to look here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. And the Bible says in verse number 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, 
because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is one of the most consequential passages of Scripture uh, for the believer, I think, uh, that we can consider. And what we understand of the words that Paul is writing here was not his deep and abiding love for God, but rather what it was, was God's deep and abiding love for him. And that's why he said, the love of Christ constraineth us. And so uh, it was God's love for him that compelled him to serve. And, you know, when we understand how much God loves us and all that he has done for us, it should cause something within us to rise up, to want to demonstrate our love in return, to express our gratitude in return. For the Bible says in 1 John four nineteen, we love him because he first loved us. And so our service, our very lives should be lived as an expression of love in response to the one uh, who loved us with a perfect love. And I wanna just mention that the Bible tells us here uh, in two verses, it's reiterated, it says, if one died for all, then we're all dead. So here we see an indication he died for all and that all were dead. Then in verse 15, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Let me just submit something to you this morning. And that is that uh, the Lord uh, died for all. <laughs> you say, well, that's what it said, pastor. That's not so brilliant. But let me say this to you, that there are some um, theologians out there that want to put forward the notion uh, that uh, there's something called a limited atonement, and that says that Jesus died for some, but not for all, that he only died for the elect. And you know, I understand how that they have taken that out of the context of the totality of scripture and have gone to seed on that point. And, and by the way, there are many reformed theologians and, and uh, Calvinists that believe that. But let me just say, the Bible is very clear. It says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that means anybody, that means everybody, believeth on him, uh, should not perish, but have everlasting life. We know that the Bible says, uh, let him that is a thirst come and drink of the water of life freely. And everybody gets thirsty. You see, the gospel is available to whosoever will receive it. And uh, sometimes people get carried away with this idea that uh, because not everyone is going to be saved, Jesus really didn't die for everyone. That's not what it says. It says one died for all. And so please know 
Jesus died for you and he died for every one of your friends and loved ones. He wants for them to be saved. And we who have been saved should, the Bible says in verse 15, not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them. So um, you have often, if you've been around freeway, heard me say that I believe that word henceforth is a powerful word in the Bible. Sometime you ought to do a study, just go through uh, the New Testament and take notice of all the times that the word henceforth appears. And what henceforth means is from this moment on, from this time forward. Everything's changing henceforth from this point forward. And I believe in the life of the believer. There needs to be a long history of henceforth moments where you have encounters with God, where you know from that moment forward, your life will never be the same again. Sometimes I uh, will talk to folks and ask them uh, to tell me about their life in Jesus Christ. And oftentimes I'll hear about their conversion or I'll hear about their baptism and or maybe that they uh, dedicated their life to the Lord at a youth camp. And those are all fine and wonderful. But you know, what decisions have you made lately? What is there in your life that God is working on you about now? What decisions recently have you come to by the leadership of the Holy Spirit that have affected a henceforth moment for you that from that moment forward, you knew that you were not going to be exactly the same person. I believe today that what we need to recognize is that when we understand who we are in Christ and when we come to trust him, that that should be a henceforth moment, not just that I have had my destiny changed, but my life in every way has been changed. And so what the Bible indicates to us then in verse 17 is this, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In other words, that there's a moment in time, a henceforth moment that occurs in the life of the believer when everything changes. There has to be a a pivotal moment, a seminal moment in your life where from that point forward, your life will never, ever be the same again. Now, we can look back on perhaps moments of joy and grief that help to mold us into the person that we are. Perhaps we can look to catastrophic experiences and, and uh, tragic moments and say, from that moment forward, I was a different person. I was changed by that experience. But I submit to you that there is nothing more transformative to a life than the indwelling presence of the living God. And when he comes to take up residency in us, the Bible says we are a new creation in Christ. And, and that's what it says here that uh, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And uh, that means God's creation, his handiwork. In other words, God makes us over again. God doesn't just clean up the old man. He doesn't just sweep the old house and, 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 and call it good. No, what he does is he makes us into a brand new man. There's a henceforth moment that affects a change in our lives. Now, I want to just say that I realize that sometimes people get saved at uh, a later stage in their life. And uh, maybe when they get saved, they, uh, you know, had a uh, affinity for, for drinking a little bit, maybe for smoking. And, and maybe they got saved and that didn't automatically go out of their life. Uh, maybe they, they had a foul mouth and, and maybe they trusted Christ and, and still from time to time they let fly with some things that uh, they know are displeasing to the Lord. But you know what? From that moment, there should be a conscience about those things. From that moment, 
there should be a concerted effort to overcome those things in the life because now the Holy Spirit of God is within you and, and there's a henceforth moment. Now, I've heard many people give testimonies about uh, the change that came over them when they trusted Christ as their Savior. And I've heard some of them go to the extent of saying things like, um, this is what happened to me and bless God, if you didn't get what I got, then you didn't get it. Well, you know what? You're not the gold standard for what every believer needs to try to live up to. And your experience doesn't necessarily uh, serve as the end all example of what everybody's experience in the Lord is going to be. You see, uh, it's just like our children. They're all different. I have kids that, uh, you know what, listen, if I look at them crossways, they're going to cry. I have other kids that uh, if I uh, give them the stink eye, they're going to they're gonna be upset. Others of them, you, you know, <laughs> you can spank their bottoms and chew them out and, and they just kind of look at you. And, and you know, they all respond differently. The fact is that God loves his kids and all his kids behave differently. We all have a different experience, a different timeline, a different race. And so I'm not going to try to judge somebody's life by uh, the pace of change that's uh, that they're undergoing that's observable uh, to mortal man uh, because I know that if God is in you, he is at work molding you into his image and the transformation, it took place just immediately, you see, and we were imputed the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. We became holy before him in love, blameless really, and so that the accuser of the brethren could no longer come into the throne room of heaven and justifiably accuse you of anything because the sin has been entirely uh, washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And so I want to ask you, what's new about you? What's changed in your life? As I think about this, I think about uh, the, the man that was possessed of devils, the maniac of Gadara in the coast of the Gadarenes in Mark chapter five. And uh, the Bible tells us uh, a very uh, dark and uh, hurtful picture really of what his life was like. The Bible says in Mark five that um, they came over onto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, Immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit and he had, who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, the whole concept and idea of living in a cemetery doesn't appeal to me. Uh, you know, I don't believe in ghosts and, and uh, I'm trusting in the Lord, but that's just not something I prefer to do. But the Bible says that uh, they couldn't bind him with chains and because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, the chains have been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. That's more of a phenomenon we've seen in recent years of people that uh, try to do uh, some sort of referral of pain and they'll cut themselves or they'll hurt themselves in order to try to uh, refer pain to somewhere else out of their mind and really the only place in the word of God that we find that is in those that are under the influence of the devil that is something that the devil wants to do he wants to hurt us he wants to inflict more pain upon us he wants to leave scars in our life and so uh, when you see young people that are cutting or adult people that are cutting just understand that that's not a healthy psychological exercise it is something that is done demonically to hurt and to destroy. And that's what was happening to this young man. And the Bible says, and when Jesus saw afar off, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him and cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. 
Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. You see, the devil is Apollyon. He's a destroyer. He's the thief spoken of in uh, uh, John chapter 8 he, and John chapter 10. He cometh to steal and to kill and to destroy. And the Bible tells us here, they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid you see uh, when a person is truly transformed by christ the devil and his minions and the unsaved world are mystified by it and it really unsettles them now here's a guy whose life was in misery. He lived in the mountains, the caves and the tombs and he cut himself. He couldn't be bound with chains or with new rope. He was tormented day and night by at least 2,000 demons and uh, his life was in misery. And now he was sitting, he was clothed, he was in his right mind and they were afraid of him now. Can you imagine that? I would have been afraid of him before, that he had superhuman strength, that uh, he probably looked like an animal. He was uh, maybe more like a werewolf than he was a man to them. And it was something that uh, was just on the line of the dark and the demonic and the occultic. And, and it would have been terrifying to many who passed by that way at night. And now here he is with a transformed life by Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us here that they were afraid. And so uh, they, when they saw it, uh, uh, and they that saw it told them how it befell to him and was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. They wanted Jesus to leave. Uh, they thought, you know, this isn't a good thing. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed, and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Well, in this narrative of a transformed life, we see identified a henceforth moment, where that when he came to be saved by Jesus, everything changed. His life calmed down. It settled down. He was dressed properly. He was clothed, it says. And the Bible tells us he was sitting, he was clothed. He was in his right mind. He was able to have the right kind of thought processes. And the Bible tells us that, um, that he was sitting and he was clothed and in his right mind. And then the Bible tells us that when Jesus came, the Bible tells us here that he was sitting in the ship, this man who had been possessed of the devil, and prayed the Lord that he would just let him be with him. He just wanted to be with the Lord. What a transformation. He had been with the devils. He had been in the tombs and in the mountains and his life had been miserable and now all he wanted was to be with Christ. And the Lord suffered in mind. He didn't allow him to come, but he said, I want you to go home and I want you to tell your friends how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion upon thee. And so he went back to that 10 city area called Decapolis and he began to publish there in Decapolis the great things that Jesus had done for him and all men did marvel. That's the power of a changed life. I wonder, do your friends see the difference in you? Do they see the transformation in you? And is that transformation not only making all the difference for you, but for those that know thee? You see, Jesus said, 
now that you're changed, go tell your friends. Don't live your life any longer for yourself. That's what we read here. The Bible says that we should not henceforth live unto ourselves. And so when we're changed, our lives change from selfish to being others-minded and living our life for God and for the benefit of others. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I wonder what's new about you. What henceforth moment have you had lately where you knew from this moment forward, I will never be the same because of what Jesus has done for me. I want to say in about, oh, 14, 14 minutes, we're going to start Vacation Bible School. I hope that you'll get the kids together. I hope you make some phone calls, send some text messages, uh, get things all set on the TV set, the computer, the tablet, however you're going to watch. Register those kids and then bring them on by the church. Give us a buzz to let us know you're coming down. We'll be excited to see you coming. I want to give those kids their shirts and their verses and their craft. It's going to be a great week. Be in prayer. And I, I want to just specially say, please be in prayer for Kurt and for his loved ones as they are dealing with the home going of Pat. And I hope that you and all our church family have a wonderful week. May God bless you.